This is going to be about why the Bible is a fun book. A guy came to me and said that he has a hard time reading more than just a few verses. And, you know, that's understandable when you first start out reading. But he talked about how he gets bored. And he just can't stand to read more than a few verses or a page. You know, I've had people tell me this tons and tons of times when they see me reading the Bible out in public and stuff. And people have been brainwashed into thinking that the Bible is just some cute little book of sayings for goody two-shoes. Or something your grandma uses. Or something your grandma just has laying around on the table and on the bookshelf. They think it's just a bunch of names or something really old fogey like or uh, a bunch of do this and don't do that. They think that's all the Bible is. This uh, this one lady saw me reading the Bible and said, oh, how cute he's reading uh, the little cute. He's reading his little Bible. And I'm thinking the Bible is not a cute. You, you obviously don't know what's in this Bible. I mean, there is a man in this Bible that picked up the jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand men with it. Uh, there are stories in this Bible where a guy kills 300 people at the same time. <clears throat> I mean, just in the, within the first few chapters, a brother kills his own brother. Um, just in the first few chapters, a snake, a serpent, convinces a woman to eat off of a tree and causes her to lose eternal life. You know, it's not a cute little book. It's a bloody book. And the fact that she called it a cute little book really just underestimates the entire book. Uh, this one guy said, why are you reading Revelation? It's already happened. No, that's not right. It's not already happened. Uh, I had somebody, I've had several people ask me, why are you reading Revelation? And just look at me with disgust. They, they have no love for the Word of God. Even the ones that claim to be these youth pastors. You see, the, uh, there's a lot of these youth pastors. They care nothing about the Bible. They have uh, no business being anybody's pastor. Because if you don't love the Bible, you shouldn't be that. You, you should just keep quiet when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but even if Revelation had already happened like that guy said, why wouldn't you still read it? You know what I mean? That makes no sense. It's not already happened, but even if it had, why wouldn't you still read it? I mean, you have to read about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and the so-called heroes of black history month over and over again in school. You know, that stuff's boring to me. I don't care about that stuff. And I'm not, I mean, not say, I'm not saying that stuff's bad to read about Abraham Lincoln and all that. It's good to read I'm, I'm, and learn some history. But still, the Bible's not boring to me. That stuff's boring to me. But these same people, they they uh, they say, why are you reading the Bible? That's just old news. Well, you, they have to celebrate men like Nelson Mandela. They they love to celebrate that. And somebody like Nelson Mandela was married three times. He committed adultery, fathering at least one child out of wedlock. And let them hear about a preacher who did that. You know, they hate preachers who um, have been married more than once and they'll talk bad about him, but yet they love to celebrate men like Nelson Mandela who did the same thing. And I'm not saying anything about the mistakes he made. I'm just showing you the hypocrisy there where somebody like him did all these things, yet if a preacher does it or a Christian, they love to badmouth him. Now, the same guy, Nelson Mandela, he founded... Uh, a terrorist branch, and the branch bombed malls, movie theaters, restaurants, and other civilian locations. He pleaded guilty to 156 acts of public violence, including bombings that killed women and children. Mandela advocated necklacing, which involves putting a tire filled with gasoline around a person's neck and lighting it on fire. When he was arrested, Mandela possessed hundreds of thousands of explosives, including hand grenades and minds <clears throat> but yet they'll read about him they'll celebrate him uh, they'll down the bible they'll down people who love the bible another one 
Martin Luther King denied the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, and the resurrection. They celebrate him. Uh, Harriet Tubman, she claimed to have strange visions and vivid dreams that led her to being devoutly religious. Muhammad Ali, here's a quote from Muhammad Ali. He said, I'm the most recognized and loved man that ever lived because there weren't no satellites when Jesus and Moses were around. So people far away in the villages didn't know about Moses and Jesus, basically. He said, I asked my mama, I said, Mama, how come everything is white? I said, why is Jesus white with blonde hair and blue eyes? Why is the Lord's Supper all white men? You know, uh, they celebrate people like this. And uh, I, I did this study back in, I think it was February. That's why I got all these quotes from these certain people. Because these people were being celebrated. They were hanging down. Uh, and like little posters hanging down in the public library in the kids section. These people that are doing these blasphemous things. Why are they being celebrated? And the Bible's being put down. Why would you celebrate these people? If you're wanting to celebrate black people, there's plenty of great black people to celebrate. But these aren't the ones to be celebrating. But um, why the guy says, why read the Bible? It's already happened. Well, all these other people that this guy celebrate, what their story has already happened. So why do you read them if you're going to go with that logic? But the Bible is a fun book. Even if the stories in it in the Old Testament have already happened, Abraham's story's already happened. You still read about Abraham Lincoln. You know, David's story's happened. You still read about George Washington. The Ethiopian eunuch story, he's already happened. But you don't want to read that, but you'll you'll uh, want to read about Martin Luther King. Ethio the Ethiopian eunuch's a lot better than Martin Luther King. But the Bible's a fun book. The stories have already happened, but they picture something that's yet to happen. And that's where the types come in. The Bible's fun because of the types. I mean, for example, you got the type of the rapture in the Old Testament. In Genesis 5, 24, you got Enoch. He was not, for God took him, it said. He was translated that he should not see death. And that pictures people who are alive at the rapture and never have to die. Uh, Enoch left the earth before the flood, picturing the Christian leaving before the tribulation. The book of Joshua pictures the second coming over and over again. In Joshua 9, 2, it says, They gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. That's exactly what they do against the Lord Jesus Christ and Israel and the saints at the second coming. They gather themselves together to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Joshua is one big picture of the second coming. Joshua is the same name as Jesus, even. I mean, all the battles of Joshua that he goes through are pictures of the second coming. David killing Goliath pictures Jesus killing the Antichrist. Abraham sacrificing his one and only son pictures the father sacrificing the, the only begotten son of God. So you got the types. The stories in the Old Testament, they're types and pictures of something yet future. That's why the Bible is fun. You're reading it, and you're reading history, but you're also reading the future too. And then the plots, the plots of the Bible. You know, you got all, you got so many plots, and you know, everybody talks about all the time Hollywood has run out of thoughts or plots or an original thought. They can't come up with original thought anymore. You know, you're pretty much uh, watching remakes and the same plot over and over again. They can't come up with anything original. And the thing is, the very those very plots themselves, they got from the Bible. When I tell people this, they look at me like I'm crazy. But think about it. You know, you got movies like Jaws, Open Water, Deep Blue Sea, you know, about some type of creature in the water killing people. Well, that's out of the Bible. Jonah 1.17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. 
And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah got ate by a big sea monster. Or think about the Lion King. That's obviously stolen from the Bible. Think about it. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's also King of Kings. So the Lion King. Or what about Fast and the Furious? They got about 15 of those movies. Well, 2 Kings 9.20 and the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. He was fast and furious way before Vin Diesel and Paul Walker was. Well, what about uh, movies like Toy Story and Pinocchio, where you got uh, an object that shouldn't be talking, getting up and moving around and talking? Well, that's Revelation thirteen fifteen, where the false prophet brings life to the image of the beast. Or what about Star Wars? I've never actually seen the Star Wars movies before, but I get it. It must be about wars and the uh, involving people in space. So Star Wars, Judges five twenty, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Revelation 12, 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. The angels are called stars. There's war in heaven, so you got star wars. Or what about frozen? Job 38, 30, the waters are hid as with a stone. The face of the deep is frozen. Elsa wouldn't even be able to survive up there. What about finding Nemo? Well, Jesus called the disciples fishers of men. David said the, that the Lord drew him out of many waters. Before you were saved, you were just a lost fish, you see. And Jesus threw the net and caught you. What about the Wizard of Oz? Revelation 4.3. Revelation 21.19. See that where it talks about an emerald. Where is... Dor where does Dorothy go? What is it called? The Emerald City? Isn't that where she goes? Someplace like that? Where do you think they got that idea? They got it from the Bible. It says in Revelation 4, 3, And he said, He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight likened to an emerald. So the em I wonder what the Emerald City is trying to copy. In Revelation 21, 19, describing the city and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald. So the emerald city. Or what about Titanic and a perfect storm? Any ship shipwreck movie. Well, you see Acts 27 and Paul's shipwreck. You see the Bible's got shipwrecks. Or what about Beauty and the Beast? Well, that's Revelation 17 where you got the great whore mystery Babylon rides the beast. So you got Beauty and the Beast there. What about Iron Man? Well, D Daniel 2.43 where you see the iron mixed with miry clay. There's your Iron Man. So it's got the plots. The Bible's got the types. The stories are not just history. They're not just fascinating stories. They also represent something in the future. You've got all the plots from the movies or in the Bible. you got the action. You see a supervillain rebels against an almighty creator, and the battle begins. The devil said, I will be like the Most High. The battle begins. you got stuff like Abraham. A guy like Abraham defeats five armies with 318 of his trained servants. In 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22, it's got some of the greatest action you ever heard, where it says, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. David waxed faint, right? And Ishbi Binab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear was spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, Thought to have slain David. So he's got a new new King James. He thought to have slain David with it. But Ab Abishai, the son of Zariah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachiah the Hushathite slew Saph, 
which was of the sons of the giant. And there was a battle, again, a battle in God with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jero, uh, Jerry Regim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. You see that? A bunch of giant slain going on in the Bible. Or what about David's mighty men in Second Samuel 23, Verse 8, it says, These be the names of David's mighty men whom David had. The Tecmonite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. 800 people he killed at one time. You never seen Jackie Chan do that or Jet Li. You never seen them do that. And after him was Eliezer the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were... <coughs> gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistine until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where it was a piece of ground foot of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. You see these uh, battle scenes. You can't compare to these. And the three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephium. And David was it with them in an hold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me to drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of the Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. So they went and, and killed a whole bunch of Philistines to get this water. David's like, they just put their lives in jeopardy to get this water. I'm pouring it out to the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went, that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And Abiashai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, the chief of, was chief among three, and he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them, and had the name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain, albeit he attained on unto the first three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab, he went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow, and he slew Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. How cool is that guy? He killed two lion-like men, then he slew a lion in the midst of a pit, not just on a regular day, but in a time of snow, and then he slew this Egyptian that had a big spear he sm uh, that was a, a big old dude with a big spear, and he knocked the spear out of the guy's hand and then killed him with his own spear. That's really cool. And the Bible has that, all those action scenes, all the plots that you love from the movies, all the love stories even. A lot of these women like, like love stories. Well, what's the Bible about? Uh, Jesus and his bride, the father and his bride. Adam died because he loved Eve more than he loved God. Women would find that romantic. Uh, brotherly love between Jonathan and David. It's got brotherly love. Uh, the apostles die in the Bible because of their love for Jesus Christ. It's got love stories. It's got supernatural stuff in there. All kinds of it. It's a supernatural book. In Genesis 19... Two angels strike a bunch of sodomites blind to protect Lot. In Genesis 28, <coughs> Jacob is visited in his dreams by angels descending on a ladder and by the Lord himself. Way before Freddy Krueger ever entered in somebody's dreams, the Lord was getting in people's dreams. He came into Abimelech's dream. 
and told him he was a dead man. And when Israel was in the wilderness journey, the Lord could visibly be seen to them as a cloud and as fire. Uh, Saul goes to the witch of Endor, and she conjures up Samuel after he died. Uh, some men in Acts 19 are attacked by some guys who are devil-possessed, and they leave naked and wounded. Uh, consider the man with unclean spirits with supernatural strength in Mark chapter 5. He cries and cuts himself with stones. Uh, Paul could heal people by sending them handkerchiefs or aprons that he had on his body in Acts 19.12. The shadow of Peter passing by someone could heal them in Acts 5.15. The Bible is full of supernatural stuff. Over and over again, you see the supernatural taking place in the Bible. It's a very interesting book. Um, what about the common sayings in the Bible? The common sayings in the Bible, I you could I would like to just do a whole series of lessons on the common sayings in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes ten nineteen it says a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Where that's where you get the saying, money talks. In Genesis twenty one twenty one it says, And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. That's what that's where you get the saying, outlandish women. That's what the old timers used to say. That's outlandish. When when the when these people go get a, a woman from another land, a strange woman, they say those are the outlandish women. He took and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt, an outlandish woman. Uh, the people in Noah's day, what did they do? They missed the boat. You know why? Because they didn't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. That's where two of the two more common sayings come from. It says in Romans thirteen eleven, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So it's high time to wake out of sleep. That's where you get the saying, it's high time. It's high time you go do this or that. What about the saying, I reckon? Romans eight eighteen. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Genesis three fourteen. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. He made the serpent bite the dust. Or another one bites the dust, as they say. Genesis 4.1 And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived in bare Cain, and said, I had gotten a man from the Lord. So Adam and Eve were raising Cain. In Genesis eleven nine it says, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. Babel. When somebody is talking nonsense, they're babbling. What happened at Babel? They got their language confounded. It's like to each other they were talking nonsense. They were babbling. In Genesis nineteen twenty four. Then the Lord rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. So he's raining down fire and brimstone. You know the word faggots. You know what faggots are? A bundle of sticks bound together for fuel. What are they? What's the word that they uh, that they call homosexuals? And the Lord burned the homosexuals with fire and brimstone. That's where you get the saying: "Faggots are for firewood." In Exodus 32, 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So to them, this, this calf was a holy cow. Or what about the saying, the apple of my eye? In, in Psalm 17, 8, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. In Isaiah 57, 20, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. No rest for the wicked. They're like the troubled sea which cannot rest. No rest for the wicked. It says in Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of the torment is sent up forever and ever, and they have 
no rest, day or night. In Daniel chapter 5, he, uh, Belshazzar's having a party in there, and uh, a, a hand comes in there and writes on, on the wall, and nobody could read it. Nobody could read what was written on the wall, so that's where you get the saying they couldn't read the handwriting on the wall. You see, you need the Holy Spirit to tell you what God said. The natural man doesn't understand it. They couldn't read the handwriting on the wall. 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 7 talks about a thorn in the flesh. In uh, Matthew 5, 41, it says, And whosoever should compel thee to go a mile, go with them twain. Well, that's where you get the saying, go the extra mile. The Bible's full of these common sayings. On every other page, you'll find some common sayings. Or what about the horror of the Bible? Do you like horror movies? Okay. Uh, in uh, Proverbs 7, 25 through 27, it says, Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So there you got the a haunted house. You see the last house on the left, the house that all the kids should be scared to trick-or-treat at, is her house in Proverbs 7, 27. Or what about the rich man in hell? Luke 16, how does it get any scarier than that? You know, imagine the scene. The rich man lived deliciously, lived his whole life pampered. He dies. Suddenly, he wakes up in hell. No longer being pampered. He's thirsty. He's begging for a drop of water on his tongue. He's tormented in this flame. Or what about the angels in hell? Imagine the scene. Jude 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day. What about future telling, the psychics, the horoscopes, the fortune tellers, the tarot cards, the palm readers, the, the false prophets? You see that? That's what people are into today. The, the psychics, the horoscopes, fortune tellers, calling the psychics on the hotlines or whatever. The Bible has future telling. You don't need all that stuff. The Bible tells you where you will go when you die. That's telling you the future. If you're saved, you're going to be present with the Lord according to 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And Philippians 1, 23. The Bible tells you what's going to happen in the last days. See Matthew 24. See the book of Revelation. It tells you the fate of the devil and the angels that rebelled, Revelation 20 and verse 10. It tells you what happens in eternity. And uh, in the back to the in back to the future, he went to the future, got like a little magazine that told him all the sports scores for like 50 years. He and one guy took it back to the past and got rich from it. But the Bible tells you how to be rich in the future. It does the same thing. It says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The Bible tells you how to be rich in the future. In John 14 2, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. In 2 Timothy 2 12, it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If, he, if we deny him, he also will deny us. So you see that? The Bible tells you how to get rich in the future. It tells you the future. It's future telling. And you see, this is why the Bible is so fun. It's got the types. It's got the plots. It's got the action. It's got the love stories. It's got the, it's got the common sayings. It's got the horror it's got all this stuff that people like, but they don't want to get it from the Bible for some reason. But the thing about it is, <clears throat> the Bible has all that, and at the same time, the Bible is true. It's a real thing. It really happened, and the things in it, it's got even more things in it that haven't even happened yet. So read your Bible. Study your Bible. Memorize the Bible. Uh, meditate in it day and night.